Grace, if you're around, I'd love you to organize a recording. We are now recording. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, I'm not sure exactly how this works because I'm just the anchor man, but there should be a and a window here somewhere, probably the chat. So if you've got anything you'd like to ask, please just throw it straight in there. Chris will be uh, reading them and moderating them and getting rid of the ones he doesn't like. Um, and all the ones he does like, he will, um, he'll bring up during section breaks. So please go crazy, throw whatever you like into there. And um, but don't be worried if you do get ignored, we have a final Q and A session at the end of all this where we can really do a deep dive into any concerns you might have. So, uh, cool. So why are we here today? We are here today to talk about consensus algorithms and or mechanisms. Um, so I hope that's why you think you're here. So basically the consensus mechanism is a fairly critical section of every blockchain. So it's fairly important that we understand, you know, what they are, what they do, why we want them, um, and why I'd pick one over another. We're then gonna go through a few examples of what consensus mechanisms are currently available for use in Ethereum. Um, and we'll be comparing and contrasting some good and bad bits about all of them. Um, after that, we're going to do a deep dive into IBFT2. So really, IBFT2 is the new consensus mechanism that has just been released in Pantheon. Uh, we're going to talk about where it comes from, what it does, how it does it, and um, a lot of you know, you just take you through, through the code. Nice name Rudy on this call, and they're all German. They're going to have trouble. <laughs> So anyway, so um, after that, we will be running up a quick demo where we'll show you how to spin up an IBFT2 network, show how it behaves, explain some of you know the, the inner workings of why we've set it up and how we've set it up. We'll then do things like adding and removing validators from the, the authorized pool of miners. And then we'll transfer some funds and just kind of try to prove that Ethereum works the same way it always has just with a replaced version of proof of work. Now on there, it says that I'm going to deploy a contract, but the truth is I, I'm just not going to do it. I'm really sorry if that's going to make your day, but it, it's not going to happen. Anyway, so before we go any further, I'd love to make a few friendly reminders. Uh, can you all please mute your microphones if you haven't already? Um, I would love to hear what you have to say, but maybe at the end. Um, ask as many questions as you like in the chat. We will pause to handle them. Um, there are, there's like a full on Q and A session after the demo, which is at the end of the presentation. And we really do want to dive into questions and help people out and see where we can get to. As you probably worked out, this is being recorded. So don't do anything you may regret later. Um, and once we've finished all this, this presentation, we will be packaging up the recording, the materials we use, and we'll email it out to all the people who are interested. Otherwise, we'll be posting links to the chat if there's something that may help you get through what we're doing now. So, let's start talking about consensus mechanisms and start talking about Pantheon. So, for those of you who have been to one of our webinars before, you've probably seen a picture something like this. And this really is the Pantheon software architecture. So, going from left to right on this picture, you can see we have our core code. And that's, that's really the engine room of our blockchain. So that's really where we're synchronizing against our other peers, making sure that we're propagating blocks as we need to, tracking and storing transactions, and then doing a bit of mining. After that, we've got the chain processing. And that's really about when we, when we receive blocks and when we receive transactions, how do we validate them? How do we process them? How do we make sure that this newly received block gets into the blockchain? The next section is P2P, peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's really the, the network, you know, the network aspects of Pantheon. So how do we find our peers? How do we bind to our peers? How do we share messages with them? How do we recognize the, the chain state and the reputation of, of any given peer? And then apparently we have a whole lot of schedulers, which I do not have the knowledge to speak on. And finally, we've got the state. And the state of an Ethereum node really is uh, the, the blockchain itself. It's the world state, which is generated from that blockchain. 
Um, and there's typically a few bits of data which we have to persist in there as well, which represent the state of the consensus mechanism at any time. Now, one of the things that makes me really sad about this picture is that there's no consensus mechanism written on it. And as a consensus mechanism engineer, that's, that's kind of bad. So maybe if we drill in, we might be able to find something slightly more useful. Oh, look at that. We found something more useful. So really what we're saying is that that minor section of Pantheon, that, that is our consensus mechanism. And so for an IBF T2 minor, and this might be a little bit small, I'll get up close to read. You can see that we, we have these concepts in the minor of things like the, the literal minor. We have some proposer selection. We have message handling and gossiping. Um, there's some peer tracking and vote management. And finally, we have some head of validation rules. So I think that's a pretty good description of the main building blocks of an IVFT2 minor. Um, I won't go into them in details now, but we will definitely touch on them much later in this presentation. So uh, sit pretty for a minute. Radio. So I suppose the question now becomes, why do we need consensus mechanisms? Um, but to me, in some respects, the question really is, why do we need blocks? Um, and that's a weird question maybe to most of you, but really those blocks are critical such that in a distributed world, everyone has a really clear understanding of what the true world state is at any given moment. And the consensus mechanism is really the manner in which we create that block. So if you really want to step through a consensus mechanism at its highest level of abstraction, the things that it needs to do is that it needs to choose transactions from the transaction pool. It clumps them all together into a block and then attaches what I call a legitimacy seal. And it uses this sealed block to update its local world state. It then forwards that sealed block onto its peers and each of its peers are responsible for validating the block and validating that seal and then using the data within it to update their local world state. And at that stage, two of our nodes are in sync. So what is it that I mean when I talk about a legitimacy seal? Well, for proof of work, it's the nonce. It's, that mass, it's the answer to that massive amount of calculation that proves that this block is you know, validly created by the miner. For click, it's a bit more simple. It's simply the signature of one of the authorized nodes. For IBFT, it's more a group of signatures of all of the authorized nodes which endorse this block. So I know when I think about consensus mechanisms, the real, the real crux is that it's a twofold problem. One, on the miner side, he has to create a seal that, that can be verified by a validator and the validator needs to be able to validate that seal. So whenever you see a consensus mechanism, it, it literally will be a seal creator side of the world and then a seal validator. And certainly you can really see that in the way that consensus that has been created. Now, it is worth quickly saying that there is lots more validation rules that need to be conducted than just the legitimacy scale. You know, we need to validate the time. We need to validate the ancestry of the blocks. We need to validate the mix hash, the difficulty, the gas price, the gas limit. There's, there's probably 15 odd rules that you need to run on a block to determine its validity. But they're not necessarily interesting in the consensus mechanism world, so we'll probably leave them for now. So, should I pause there for a minute, Chris? Sure, yeah, I've got one interesting question for you today. Mm. Right now, I should say, uh, the gossiping, does that happen over the wire? How does that happen over the wire? Uh, P2P or P2P or something else? Uh, um, right, so, Ignore, <laughs> ignore my slight naivety with this. So gossiping is, is, is an interesting problem with IBF T2. So obviously when we talk about a Pantheon network, all of your peers were found via the Kademlia protocol as part of the discovery agent. And some of those peers will be validators, but most of them won't. 
Um, and potentially I don't have a link to the validators that I need. Um, so IBFT2 has a side channel communication. So it's another dev P2P protocol, which we've called IBF. And um, so all traffic that we send goes through that. Gossip is just a layer on top of that, which is that we forward all receive packets to all other validators, just to ensure we have better network coverage. So I guess the answer is dev P2P. Excellent, thanks. Awesome, well, I might um, charge onwards. So broadly speaking, we can separate consensus mechanisms into a variety of groups. Um, you know, the first one that we've all, you know, know of is proof of work, which is what we do on mainnet. And that's basically that we hash the data in the block until we find a small enough nonce or a small enough hash and then we use that nonce as the answer. And, and this is great because it works really well in trustless environments uh, because people are incentivized to do the right thing by money and money does a lot of good things for people. Um, then we've got the proof of stake, which from my understanding is that you do the right thing or you get to lose your money. Now I've had nothing to do with this, so please don't ask me questions on it, but I do understand that uh, it's gonna be a big deal when we get to F2.0. And finally, there's proof of authority. And this is really where I've spent most of my development time. Um, and really this proof of authority implies that you have externally defined trust. So you're already operating in an environment that you trust a certain subset of people. So effectively, we're able to nominate a series of nodes to act as authorized miners. So those initial validators, will typically appear in the Genesis file because it's a core part of the network. We also would typically have a voting mechanism of, in a POA network such that we can add and remove miners from that pool of, of trusted nodes. And POA is kind of great in that you, you really have a very small runtime cost in the production of the legitimacy seal. So that seems like a bit of a win. Okay, so really quickly, before we go any further, I would just like to say that Pantheon supports a number of different consensus mechanisms. So obviously we support uh, proof of work um, and that can be proven that we act as a peer on the mainnet. Um, however, we can't really be a miner on mainnet as we only do CPU based mining. Um, we do have short circuits, which we can use for local testing and for local small chains, but it certainly doesn't produce a, uh, a trusted result. Um, we also support Click, um, and we're able to operate on both sides of Click. We can be a signer, and we can also just act as a syncing peer. Um, we've recently put in IBFT2, which we'll talk about later, but, and obviously in that case, we can be a validator or just a syncing peer. And finally, with the IBFT original protocol, we can act as a syncing peer, but we don't have the capability to act as a validator in those networks. work. Okay, so look, we're just going to quickly go through a few of the consensus mechanisms. Um, I'm sorry if you already all know this. I will try to keep it short and sweet. So proof of work. People are economically incentivized to do the right thing. It works really well in trustless environments because people mine good blocks because it's just too expensive not to. Um, but for the same reason, it's pretty terrible for semi-trusted or trusted environments, uh, just purely due to the real world compute costs. It's just not really feasible. Liveness is basically given because someone always wants to get paid. So we're always going to have miners. People are always going to be doing the work. And that's wonderful. Unfortunately, it doesn't have transaction finality. So if you go and put your transaction on mainnet, uh, it's possible that a chain, chain reorg may effectively kick that transaction back out again. Um, so you may want to be careful with what you're doing, but obviously, the general rule of thumb is that you wait your 15 blocks and eventually will come good. Um, for critical validation rules, for consensus mechanisms, we are always looking at that nonce and mix hash and making sure it matches the block content. We also need to make sure that timing is valid because there's certain circumstances 
that uh, a spurious miner could attempt to uh, run away with time. And that's probably something that gets prevent should be prevented. But otherwise, I think we'll leave proof of work alone. POA. Great, so this is where I actually start speaking about things that I really understand. So the first example we're gonna go into for POA is click or clique for our British brethren. Um, so like we said, this is a POA. So this implies that we have externally defined trust. And that means that we have a group of validators who are allowed to mine blocks. Now specifically in click, the validators take turns to mine blocks in a round robin format. Um, if, the, if the current in turn signer doesn't produce a block in time, the other validators are allowed to jump in and provide that block in order to maintain the network liveness. Now, the in turn signer does have a very slight difficulty uh, benefit over his peers. And so he will always produce a preferred block. Um, the, the other nice thing about click is that the entire protocol is documented in the block headers that we don't need a side channel of communications and network overheads to make this work. It all basically fits in the block. Unfortunately, click doesn't provide transaction finality uh, due to this ability for your peers to jump in with a secondary block because that can create small forks. So the critical validation rules for click are kind of a bit more complex, unfortunately, and for a few strange reasons. So the most obvious thing that you need to do is uh, make sure that the signature in the block, which is that legitimacy seal, um, is able, you can, you can prove that that signature came from an authorized signer. But as we said earlier, the signer pool can change. That's why we have this the voting mechanism. So therefore every node in the network is required to track all the signers at every block height so that they can sensibly validate that signature. They also need to validate that the difficulty in the block matches the signatures in turn or out of turn status. And finally, they need to make sure that the signer has not produced more than one block in the last N on two blocks where N is the number of validators in the network. Again, this is to prevent one miner from spuriously creating blocks and running away with the network in a direction we do not want to travel. Oh, come on. Hey, there we go. Terrific. IBFT. So this is IBFT, the original. Um, you can see there's the heap link up there if anyone's interested. Um, so IBFT is another POA protocol, um, but rather than being a round robin like click, it's much more like the validators all come together to agree to make a block at the same time. And so they, they have a shared responsibility in creating each and every block. Um, they use a side channel of communications. So they, in this example, they have an extension of the ETH protocol to do this side channel work to reach this agreement. Um, and the block then needs to be signed by a super majority of the validators which is a, a weasel word for saying most of the validators need to sign it. Now, IBFT is great in that it does provide transaction finality. If your transaction is in a block and you can guarantee that it cannot come out again, there will be no uncles, there will be no forks, there will be uh, no chain reorgs. So again, when we do our critical validation rules, you need to ensure that all of the signatures are from known validators. You need to make sure that there's no uncles. IBFT doesn't use difficulty, so that should be zero. And again, the validators must always track the, uh, or the, the validators listed in the header, they need to track the list that you've tracked locally um, through the voting mechanism. Now, before I jump into IBFT2, Sure. You want to know if there's any good questions you want to answer? I don't want to talk about prog power. <laughs> you don't? Would you want to talk about IBFT versus ring signatures or shall that be left till the end? Uh, um, it should be left to the end once I've learned a little bit more about ring signatures. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, I've also got a lower level question about uh, the implementation of IBFT, but I suspect that'll fit better after you've introduced IBFT. IBFT two, I hope. I don't that's, think that's that's where I'll frame it as. Yes. Excellent. Do that. <laughs> okay, so IBFT two. Um, cool. So uh, IBFT two is based on IBFT1. It's a slight homage in some respects. Um, however, we have put in a few small enhancements which increase the network liveness and safety in some corner cases. But by and large, the workflow is very similar um, in that uh, one validator is responsible for producing a block and sends that out to the authorized validator group. The validators uh, receive the block and then share signatures with each other. And they then use those received signatures to insert into the block to endorse the block. Uh, each validator would then import that sealed block and propagate it to its neighbors. So the rest of the network and eventually would propagate out. Um, so this, this process of propose a block, endorse a block and, uh, and, and propagate a block, we call that a round. Okay, so the round is the primary currency of IBFT2. Um, and th that's the repeatable chunk. So once we've got one block on, we just do that again, and then again, and again. Um, but obviously this is distributed computing, so rounds can and will fail, um, and so they have timeouts. Um, and if we do hit this timeout, it's not really a big deal. It's kind of a normal behavior, unfortunately. Um, but if it does happen, we just switch proposers and we start a new round. Um, the slight caveat there is that each subsequent round is always longer than the previous, so that eventually we should end up at a time that a block can actually be made. It's also worth saying that each round that we execute is uniquely identified by two numbers. One is the chain height that the round is targeting, and the other one is how many rounds have failed at this height. So therefore, every single round is uniquely identifiable. And that's going to be really important in a few minutes' time. So Trent, does a round, or is a round, just the lock header of a whole block? Yeah, terrific. So a round is, is the whole block. Um, so that means that the proposer would plug the transaction from the pool, uh, would then apply a, an unsigned header to that block, and here's the route for the validators. Then once the, valid, the validators would then validate that block as far as they can, uh, they would then share signatures and they would then reinsert all those signatures from their peers back into the block and then propagate that as a sealed block by the F protocol. Ah, I noticed you mentioned propagation there. Can you speak quickly to uh, how propagation works for IBFT2? Absolutely. Um, so, Hang on a second. So IBFT2 um, is effectively uh, a helper to the side of F. So all IBFT2 doesn't attempt to do any of the jobs of F. They simply create the block, import it to the blockchain. So the validator would create the block, import it to the blockchain, and then the F protocol would actually see that change, pick up the new block, and, and the F protocol would propagate it exactly the same way as standard Ethereum. <clears throat> All right, cool. Um, one more is a nice, easy one. How long do these rounds take? Excellent, excellent. So um, the initial round length is configurable in your Genesis file. And every time we successfully get a block into the blockchain, we would reset to that number. Um, we are currently running some nodes in Stockholm, Sydney, and North Virginia. And we're running with a round time of 10 seconds, and we haven't hit that yet. So um, we found that, that we are successfully getting those four validators to synchronize in, in sub-second at the moment, but they're empty blocks. So by the time you start throwing in some transactions and a bit of weight to that, you probably will blow out. But um, yeah, at the moment we're working for 10 seconds. Great, okay. 
you're good to move on. Lovely. So just quickly, so we were talking about this concept of around and <clears throat> this is a really beautiful uh, picture that as you can probably see um, that we actually had on a blog that we posted about IBFT2. And it's really a flow chart of how an IBFT2 round typically operates. So when you think of just the success case, I don't want to talk about problems just yet. So when we start a round, the first thing we say is, am I the proposer for this round? Um, and if I am, I should send out a proposal to my peers. But if I'm not, then I'll just go down and I'll wait until a proposal arrives. And when it does, I'll make sure that the block that got sent is valid. And if it is, I'll notify my peers that I have received a block and I'm happy to work with it. And we call that a prepare message. When I receive 66% of my peers sending me back a prepare message to say they also have the block and I want to use it, then I'll send out a commit message. And that commit message contains my signature. It's, so this is me saying, I like this block. Enough of my peers say that they like their block. So here is my personal endorsement of it. I will then wait till two thirds of my peers send me their endorsements. I'll insert their signatures into the block. I'll import the block and I'll start the next round. And we then basically rinse and repeat. So here's another way of looking at it. Um, if it helps that, like we said, IBFT2 has got this side channel communication set up with its peers. And we really have three, each round is comprised of three phases. First of all, the proposer sends out the proposal. All the peers then share prepare messages once they've received the proposal. And all the peers then share their commit messages once they've received enough prepares. So that might be like an easy mental model to work with. Um, we talked earlier about gossip. So one of the problems that we have is that given you don't necessarily have dedicated network links to each of your peers, you can only multicast your packets to the peers who you can see. But we've then got an agreement in every node that we will then forward your node, your packets, to the downstream nodes from me. And that way we just get a slightly better coverage over the network. And we call that forwarding system the gossip network. Um, we keep talking about this super majority in IBFT2. And, and that's, that's greater than or equals to 66% of the validators need to be saying the same thing before you can do the next step. Um, okay, cool. I have a question, but it's more regarding, let's see. Yeah, it's a lower level one. I'll leave, leave it till the uh, bit for a bit later on. True. Terrific. Okay. Um, look, this is where it kind of gets a little bit hairy. So I'll probably lie a little bit, but hopefully only through abstraction. Um, so if around, if something goes wrong, if we lose some packets, if a network cable gets unplugged, a validator crashes, you know, what happens? Now, the short answer is that you only need 66% of your validators to be working at any given moment to guarantee liveness. So if you've got 10 validators and you lose one, no one will notice. You will keep running. It will be fine. However, if you lose 34% of your validators, you're now down below our 66% threshold. So that means that it's, it's going to be bad. Um, so specifically what will happen is that one of our faces will time out. I'll send out a proposal and I just will never get enough prepare messages. And I'll wait for them and I'll wait for them and I'll wait for them and they won't arrive. So when my round times out, which is what that 10 seconds is, I'll throw away that round, all the messages received from it, and I'll start a new round. So I'll start round two. Hopefully, all of my other peers are doing something similar. Um, and we'll then all start communicating on round two. But we still don't have 66%, so we'll time that out as well. So we'll go to round three, dot, dot, dot. Eventually, someone will plug the network cable back in and we'll all start talking again. And the network will then be able to progress. 
Now, the two interesting things about this is that one, when, when your round times out, you need to tell everyone, my round has failed. And so we send out a round change message to all of my peers to say, I am moving into round two. And the other, the other problem with this is that I need to add, I need to seed that message with just a little bit of data about the round that failed. Because as we said in the past, IBFT2 demands transaction finality. If there is even a risk that someone in the previous round may have committed the block that we were looking at, we need to make sure that we continue to work with that block um, or else we risk getting chain blocks. So when we change rounds, we send around what we call a prepare certificate. And it contains just enough information regarding the previous round to explain how close I got to actually committing the block. Um, and that, that, that provides a safety assurance on the subsequent rounds that we won't fork the chain. Um, it's a little more in depth than that, but hopefully that's enough to get us through this slide. Um, it's also worth saying that when you get to a round, you always need to check if you're the proposer, because if you are, you better send that proposal for the new round. Probably didn't need a whole headline in there, but there you go. Ah, okay, Trent. So, uh, are you, are you yes. going to cover some of the interesting cases, or we could leave this till the end, about um, what happens when some of them, some validators proceed to validate the message and enter commit stage, and some do not? Because that's a bit, a bit of an edge case, but... No, look, it's, it's, it's actually the most interesting one, though, right? Um, look, I really do want to talk about it. I'm worried that time is getting slightly short, but I'd love to dive into it in the Q and A if that's okay. I think that'll work. Terrific. So just want to talk a bit about those messages that are going on across the network. So that's side channel communication. Every packet that we put in there has two uh, sort of baseline pieces of information. One, it has a signature, which guarantees that it comes from a valid validator. Don't say that three times quickly. And it also has a, a round specific identifier in it. And that way the receiver of the message is really quickly able to say, is this message, uh, is it for now? Is it from before or do I need to use it later? Um, and that just allows us to categorize messages really quickly, obviously, because it's kind of important for what we're doing. Um, so I suppose what we're saying is that messages are first class citizens in IBFT2, that they do need to be ordered. They should be validated, maybe stronger than should. And we probably also need to gossip them. Um, unfortunately at the moment, consensus mechanisms are not pluggable, um, though they are fairly modular. Um, so if you are looking to write your own, we can definitely help you out with that. So look, this is a bit heavy and the text is a bit small, um, but this is really the architecture inside the IBFT2 uh, consensus mechanism in Pantheon. And I suppose the best place to start is probably over on the left where we have this IBF1 sub protocol. So that's really our network connectivity. And IBF2 two packets flow into the miner. And if they're from a previous round, we throw them away. If they're for a future round, we go and buffer them in our message buffer. But if they're for now, well, we better gossip them to our peers and we better tell our current miner, hey, we've got some packets you might need to use. So the current miner then says, ah, yes, but is it for my current round? Or is it for a future round that I haven't got up to yet? So if it's for the current round, I'll put it into my state machine and my state machine will do some cog turning. And it may produce some IBFT2 packets, which it needs to send to its peers. So a commit message or a prepare message, and he'll send them out. If it's for a future round, if that received message was actually for a future round, we'll buffer it and we'll use it later. And if it was a round change message, if it was someone saying, hi, I've moved to round three, well, we'll shovel him off to our round change tracker. And that round change tracker is really there to say, have enough of my peers changed rounds should I stop what I'm doing and go and do something different? So that left-hand side is really how we mine blocks in an IBF2 
IBFT2 validator. The middle section is what I call shared capabilities. And this is really about where we track um, who the current validators are. And in that list, who is going to propose the next round. So they're two fairly important pieces of information, both for the miner, but also for when we validate a received header. In that, did this header come from one of my recognized proposers, recognized validators? Does it have the right signatures in it? Does the content of the header correspond with what I think the world looks like? So that's, that's really the two halves of IBFT2. So yeah, true. So just before we go into a demo, I just really want to quickly say, we've spoken about four consensus mechanisms today. Um, they all have different properties and are suitable for different environments. Um, you know, proof of work has a huge compute required. Um, it can be used in trustless environments. It doesn't require external trust, doesn't offer finality. Um, but yeah, generally I trust it. Uh, click is clique is a little different. He, he, he obviously only has a low compute power required. You must use it in a trusted environment because those authorized nodes need to have been endorsed. It doesn't offer finality, but it does almost. And you know, that, that's why I say that I trust it, but kind of only just. IBFT, again, it's a POA, so it has low compute required. You need to use it in a trusted environment. It does offer transaction finality. Um, do I trust it? Yeah, I generally trust it. Obviously, we found one or two enhancements we've put in, but by and large, IBFT2 is not bad. Um, then finally, we have IBFT2, and it has a low compute. You must use it in a trusted environment. It does give you that finality, and I completely trust it, um, even though I wrote most of it. Good old Trent, before you jump forward, quick one. Propose a selection in IBFT2. How is it, how is it defined? Is it round robin? Oh, lovely. Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, IBF, so IBFT2 um, does do a round robin for proposer selection. Um, you do have a few interesting corner cases with that. Um, in that if you have a round which fails, the next proposer may be required to re-offer the block from the previous round. So in that instance, the, although the, the proposer changed, he actually offers the same block as, as previously. So a little bit more on that in the interesting case we'll talk about at the end of the Q&A. So this will be after the demo, after your demo that's going to happen right now. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, oh, come on. Beautiful. No, terrible. Also terrible. Better. Okay. So um, I'm going to set up a, a test net now on my local machine. Um, we do have some scripts and support material, which we'll provide later. Um, I was really hoping that we we're all going to get to do this together. Um, but just um, clearly didn't provide access to anything useful. So how about I run this up and we will um, see how it all goes. So you need to go away. Oh, come on. Excellent. So, So what I've got here, shortly, when I remember how to switch screens. So we're going to set up a four node IBFT2 network. One of the nodes in the network is not a validator. Um, but we're going to do a few things like we'll, we'll try to vote him in, we'll turn him off, we'll turn him on, and we'll just make sure that the network stands up and we'll show its behaviors. So it's worth saying, so basically I'll set up this network, then do a whole lot of JSON RPCs, which I don't expect you to understand, other than to say that all of them are documented 
on our docs website. Okay, let's see what we can do. Here. Terrific. Okay, so um, this text might be a little bit large, a little bit difficult to read. So as we can see in the top corners, we've got four pantheons up and running. And what you may or may not be able to see is that the three panes here are actually producing IBFT round messages, which is indicating that they are proposers. And this top left-hand corner, he just keeps saying block propagation manager, which really means that it's receiving blocks from the network, but it's not doing any work in the validator pool. So I'm just going to throw in a, a JSON RPC and I'm basically saying, please get me the validators at block zero. So you can see that we've got one, two, wow, I've got, excellent, I've got one, two, three validators which is good because that's kind of what I should have. And in fact, we can then even say, so now let's ask for latest. How many, what are the validators in the latest block? And again, we've still got one, two, three validators. Brilliant. Now, the first thing I really want to do is I want to bring this top left panel in as a validator. I need to vote him in. So let's, let's ask one of our nodes to bring in this node. So what can we see here? I've said, let's propose a validator vote. This is the address of the validator that I'd like to bring in and I want him in, not out. Terrific. So we've cast the vote. It looks like we've got a true, um, but he's not a validator yet. Why is he not a validator yet? He's not a validator yet because one person can't sign someone in and out you need to have a super majority of people voting him in. So he's not gonna get in just yet. Um, but let's just make sure that we've cast that vote. So again, we'll ask our node, what votes have, I, have you got? And he says, ah, I have one vote. I'm voting this man, I'm asking him to come in. Fair enough, well, Maybe I actually don't want to do that vote after all. So I'm going to discard the vote. Cool, the discard has worked. And lo and behold, I've now cast the get pending votes and now we have none. So this is how we can manage our votes. This is how we can vote people in and out and we can remove and add our support for people. So having done all that, let's actually vote three into the network. So there's one vote. And we'll send, we'll send a request to one of the other validators saying, can you also vote this person in? Cool. And he's in, he's in, he's not in, he's not in, he's not in, he's still not in. Now, part of the reason he's not in is because the votes get cast into the blocks. And so you need to wait for that proposal round Robin to go all the way around before your vote has actually been propagated to your peers. Well, what's really great, um, you can now see that this guy has got IBFT round turning up. He's now one of our validators. So let's just go and confirm that this 431 address is indeed a validator in our latest block. And lo and behold, there he is. Terrific. He's gone in. And just with regard to those pending votes, yeah, they still exist. Well, that, uh, that, that's, an, <laughs> that's an interesting issue. Oh, so apparently James, I was, I was, uh, If I can jump in quickly. These four, these four nodes you're talking about, yes. are these running on your local machines? These are all running locally. Um, I have a remarkably TMUX script, which is firing up four nodes with slightly different parameters so that they can all talk to each other. Um, All right, one other question from the uh, chat. Uh, what's the timeout on a vote message? Ah, uh, vote messages, vote messages, very interesting. Um, so what happens with a vote is, 
in an in a POA system, you have an epoch block, and that's that's an arbitrarily assigned block that you put into your configuration file, and the magic number is typically thirty thousand from everything I've ever seen, and the point is that. Imagine if one validator voted someone in on block 29,000, that vote would effectively be discarded at 30,000. So therefore we always have this 30,000 block window in which we can vote people in and out. And if we don't get them in by that 30,000th block, the votes are discarded and we have to start again. Um, obviously I haven't dealt with this for a little while, but it does appear that you need to manually remove any votes that you've previously cast once they've been actioned. Now, I wanted to try something slightly uh, difficult. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna kill that top left panel. So let's just control C him. Now, the question then becomes, well, what happens to the network at large if we do that? And I'm not sure if it's really outwardly visible, but what happens is that we will get a block every two seconds up until we round Robin onto the killed node and he'll time out. We'll go into a round change and we'll then create the block. So what we should see happening is that we should get, we should go block, 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 wait, block, 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 wait. Um, hopefully you can see that, but possibly you can't. Um, but again, this is purely a function of that round robining of the proposal. Now, if we kill another pane, at that stage, we're down below our 56%. Our so we should see the entire network grind to a halt. So let's kill that. So we should now see that neither of these two panes are actually able to produce blocks. Um, unfortunately, this is just a real world consequence of block finality. You can't have liveness and block finality at the same time. So it's now been a few seconds. We haven't really seen any blocks coming out. It appears we do have a hung network at that stage. But if we bring this panel back in again. So let's start one of these, these downed nodes. Great, so he's starting up, he's waiting for some peers. Yes. Now we're actually gonna see this take a little bit of time to work out because these bottom two nodes, they're not, sorry, let's start this again. So this is gonna take a few seconds to resynchronize. This top right hand node has started in round zero. So he's saying, hey, everyone talk to me in round zero. I wanna do round zero. These two nodes are not in round zero anymore. They're in round three. So round three is gonna last for about 40 seconds. And then they'll both say, hey, we wanna to go to round four. And we're gonna to have to keep doing this longer and longer and longer until these three nodes all end up in the same time window. And then we will resynchronize. So this is gonna take a few minutes potentially, but we are recovering from a really catastrophic failure. Um, I'm not sure if we actually wanna wait for it, but if we don't, we don't have a lot else to show, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, okay, in that case, I can make you ask, answer a question sort of relevant to what's going on now behind the scenes. Uh, so- Well, I could, uh, we could start from getting lost. Oh, just, yeah, okay. just go for it. Uh, it's, it's in relation to prepared certificates. Yes. So when are they firing in what we're seeing now? Absolutely brilliant question. So, um, so let's talk about where we killed just the first node and we had the other three running. So we were going block, 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 delay. So what's really happening is that when we hit that, when you see that delay come in just before the, the redeeming block appears, that is where the, the three healthy nodes are sending out a round change message and that round change contains that prepare certificate. So that's the three of them saying, hey, we need to go to the next round. Here's the data from my previous round so that we can work out how to move forwards. So that prepare certificate is, is as you time out and as you notify your peers 
that you need to change rounds. Terrific, so you can see that these three appear to be producing blocks again. Um, so that's actually quite an interesting case where you know the network has gone uh, non-live and then as we've built it back up again, it takes a while but it does resynchronize. So if we restart, uh, so if we restart this panel, He should be able to rejoin quite quickly and easily because the network's healthy. The network is producing blocks. And every time we produce a block, that's like a resynchronization point. Um, so he should just drop straight in and it's great. You can now see that he's making IBFT round calls. Um, so the last thing we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, we're going to try to vote that... Uh, no, I don't care about that. That's because I'm an idiot. So what we're going to do is we're going to vote out that. We'll vote out that top left-hand corner again. So we'll ask one person to vote him out, except I don't know how to write. Excellent. Apparently, I don't know how to work. Excellent, and then we'll send the same thing to them. Now remember it takes a few blocks for that to occur as the votes propagate. So we'll still see a few IBFT rounds up here, but hopefully they're going to disappear shortly. Uh, no, they won't because you need to send it to more than two people in a network of this size. So let's vote them out properly. And then to prove my trick, let's check what my validators are at the latest block. And we're down to one, two, three validators. Ta-da! Um, I suppose the question then becomes, do people want to see MetaMask or do they want to just accept that this is working and is awesome? Well, I've, I've had on good authority, it is awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> there's been no request for MetaMask. Brilliant. So, unless I'm seeing something in the chat now. No, I think you're, you're saved from MetaMask. So, okay. I've got some more questions which I've uh, saved up. Thanks, questions. For okay, well, I'm not, uh, can you hold them for two seconds? Yes, I can. And I might actually stop this share. I'm going to look at each other like people. Well, before you do, what we should do is a bit of housekeeping. A bit of housekeeping. And share the feedback form, right? So uh, there was a slide in that slide deck that said... Yes, there is. Here's the feedback form. So everyone on the call... You're welcome yeah. to uh, provide the valuable feedback. And also, what was mentioned was the IBFT2 blog post, which is now also in the chat. Brilliant. Cool. Okay. And to answer that question, Sergio, uh, my understanding is the presentation will be shared via email uh, afterwards. Okay, so in that case, let's go on to the banked questions. Yeah, could we start with the easy ones, perhaps? <laughs> okay, um, let's start with the, what I think is the easiest one. What does the prepared certificate contain and how does it get used? Excellent, okay. So, um, it's really a carryover from PBFT in some respects that the prepare, so pretend I'm a node. If 
I have timed out on a given round, if I have received the proposal for this round and I've also received uh, 66% of my prepare messages, then that group together is, is sufficient evidence that I may have received enough, I may have also received enough commit messages, which means I may have committed this block. Um, so my prepare certificate is really the initial block that I received along with the prepare messages that, that match that block. Um, so that, that's what I propagate around the network. And so then the proposer for the next round, he would see my prepare certificate and say, ah, Trent may have received enough commit messages. I don't really know what's happened. So what I'll do is I will, I will use that block and start the next round with that block, just in case Trent has done something silly like committed already. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, that's good. So, the next sort of big question I've had to, I mean, a couple mentioned a couple of times directly or indirectly is one of scalability. So, this is mm. really around how does IBFT2 scale with its um, super requirement of super maturity? Cool. Um, so, we have done some scaling tests with uh, up to 20 nodes in a network. Um, now they were able to go through round changes and, and normal operation at, at that scale. Now they were all running within a, uh, a North Virginia AWS data center. So that may have skewed our success criteria. Um, equally, we don't have at this stage a really great transaction and contract generator. so. We were just simply mining blank blocks, trying to get this all working, proving that the consensus mechanism was working. Um, I would be really interested to see how this works with fully populated blocks and how that potentially affects uh, timing. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely an area that we want to be you know, heading down as part of the, the growth of IBFT2. Okay, before we, we've got some more questions, but I should sort of mention we are now at time but we'll be hanging around to answer the remaining questions if people want to stick around, but you are free to leave if you wish. And with that in mind, do you want to speak quickly to how you could imagine this may or may not scale with thousands of validators? Um, I, I would hate to try to answer that. Um, there's probably a more important question, which is why do we need thousands of validators? Um, you know, this is, it, it's an interesting problem at a solution perspective. You know, what does a validator represent in the network? Um, you know, from a purely technology perspective, engineering perspective, validators are redundancy. Um, so if you say that you have a thousand validators, that means that you're safe to lose 300 of them and maintain liveness. Um, Equally, people may argue that you want to have one validator per entity in a consortia, but again, thousands, I don't know. So I think it's about looking at real world solution cases and building a consensus mechanism, which is suitable. So this again, it comes back to this has to be run on the trusted environment, right? Correct. So it's then how many thousands of validators would you want on a trusted environment? Yeah. Okay. So with the, uh, with testing, was there any high latency testing? So you mentioned the AWS, yep. um, was there the USA, Europe, Asia? No, yeah, um, great question. So we've only run small IVFT networks, um, over high latency. So we do have a four node setup where we have one node in Stockholm, two in the U S and one in Sydney. Um, and it's, it's been operating flawlessly, but obviously it's, it's only a small network. Okay. Um, so another question about theoretical bounds in terms of scalability. So into the box of linear or polynomial really. Yeah. So obviously every time we add a node to one of these, uh, networks, we, we are going up a lot because you multicast to all other nodes. 
that we are going to hit limits as we go up. Um, I, I personally have done no work in working out where that limit may start appearing. But yes, polynomial, unfortunately. All right, so back to the IBFT2 and how it works. What happens when you get 50% of the validators uh, getting to a commit state and the other half do not in a given round? Yeah, true. So that's <laughs> where, so we've only hit 50%. So theoretically, no one should have committed. Um, so what would happen is that the 50% have reached the commit stage. They would send around prepare certificates as part of their round change process. And the, the proposal for the next round would be responsible for collating all of those prepare certificates, making sure they're all asking for the same blocks and doing the same things, and would then propose that block back to the network. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I've got another question about gossip, the gossip used. Uh, does it have any sort of uh, rate limiting uh, to prevent denial of service type activities? Okay, so the short answer is yes. The longer answer is still yes, but it's more complex. So if you're an IBFT2 node, there, there is a risk that you will, well, assume a four node network. Um, I'm one of the validators. I would receive the proposal from, from the proper proposal. Um, and I would then forward that out to the other nodes. I wouldn't send it back to the proposer, but I would send it to the other nodes. So that's, that's one tiny, tiny little bit of, of rate limiting. Um, I would then also receive the multicast proposal from all of my peers, provided they haven't sent it to me before. So there's another next tiny little bit that I'll only receive that packet from each of my peers once. Um, and subsequent receptions of the message is, is front end filtered. So if we receive the same message twice, we'll discard all the subsequent receptions of it. So that's, that's like a secondary rate limiting. Um, and, and that's really the crux of, of where, we're, um, where we're boxing the amount of network traffic. But certainly, look, gossip between the um, exponential growth in network traffic is, is fairly concerning. Um, potentially, one argument around this is that Pantheon now supports the static nodes concept, um, a la Geth. So potentially, when you do set up one of these private networks, you would deliberately um, give your validators um, direct access to all of the other ones and effectively negate the requirement for gossip. Nice, nice. Okay, so there's one more question I've got. I'm just waiting to see if anything pops up in the chat. That looks good. All right, let's move on to the IBFT versus ring signatures. Yeah, ring signatures, amazing things. Mm. What are they? So basically, uh, it's a popular form of signing things. So I've just thrown, ah, I've been, <laughs> I'm just gonna throw into the chat a link to the wiki page if people are interested. But what I suspect the main differences are IBF, uh, ring signatures, very configurable. You know, can have different settings. IBFT, less so. It has a re basically a requirement that everybody who signs it or validates it around has to be visible. There's no anonymity, uh, anonymity about it. So ring signatures allow the signers to be unknown. So rather, you have a set of people who could sign, but you don't know which ones of them did. So that's, um, but again, that's one of those configurable options depending on which flavor it you have. And the other one is IBFT must have that super majority, that 66%. Again, it's not configurable, it's, it's not changeable. Whereas the ring signatures really are configurable. They could be configured for less. Um, but I, that's my first, first blush at, under, at understanding, but I'll put a caveat there. 
can't say I've looked into influencing ring signatures, so I don't really know. So I forget who asked that and if they're still on the call, but if you want to chime in the, on the chat. Okay, that looks like an understanding. And that is the last question I had noted down. So if anybody has any more questions, throw them into the chat or you can speak up. <clears throat> Otherwise, this is looking like a wrap. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Well, on behalf of everyone here, thank you very much, Trent. That was an awesome presentation. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining. Not just you, Chris, but everyone. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>